Laguna things. There's like Laguna Candy, Laguna Ocean, Laguna Greenbelt Inc. She's going to um, introduce the, the organization and John. So thank you very much. Thanks, Stacy. Um, my name is Gabriella Morel. I um, am media and outreach director at Laguna Greenbelt Inc. And my colleague John Foley is here from uh, Laguna Greenbelt Inc. as well. He's a board member and. He worked with our uh, team on this camera study project, um, which is a few years ago now. But I'm just going to start with kind of a short intro on the on the project and the wildlife corridor. Um, so, so I don't know um, how many people are familiar with this wildlife corridor project. If you have any background at all, Geo. 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 Okay, so like a little bit. <laughs> Um, so, uh, this might be new to quite, quite a few of you. Um, the Irvine Laguna Wildlife Corridor, which also used to be known as the Coast to Cleveland Wildlife Corridor that was renamed a few years ago, um, is a connection between these two large ecosystems. So, um, if you know anything about wildlife corridors, this is the goal is to connect two large ecosystems. Um, the coastal, South Coast Wilderness is about 22,000 acres, and the Santa Ana Mountains is about 450,000 acres. And to maintain ecological integrity, we need this connection between the two. In between, um, there's a lot of urban space. So the yellow part, which thank you, Gio is also here from my organization, and he made this lovely map. Um, this area here in the middle is really difficult for animals to traverse, so um, that's why we have this habitat strip in between the two. And it's about, uh, once we count like all the different parts of the wildlife corridor, it's about six miles long. And um, we really need wildlife corridors, like I mentioned. Uh, these urban areas really make it difficult for animals to move across the landscape. And historically, they would have been able to go and move and find food and find mates and find water and escape, um, you know, any kind of like fire, flood, or environmental conditions that are harmful to them. Um, but with our urban fragmentation, these animal populations get a little bit um, shut into certain areas. And so we know from uh, some of these tests that have been done over the years that certain species are showing uh, genetic uh, diversity or genetic inbreeding. They have signals of genetic inbreeding. And some of these animals are like the mule deer, which you might know something about, bobcats on the coastal uh, wilderness areas also showing this genetic inbreeding um, signals. And the cactus, the coastal cactus fern, We have some other target species as well for our wildlife corridor. So um, the loose belt vireo, the California nutcatcher, which is a federally threatened listed species, and then coyotes and bobcats, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, this slide just kind of showing, it's kind of hard to see on this projection, but there's these little areas here, and just showing where we did our camera study in 2017 and 2018. We wanted to look at, you know, what kind of activity is happening in the wildlife corridor and um, so we get a better idea of what kind of issues we're looking at and where we can improve the movement. Here's just some kind of images to give you a mental picture of what the corridor looks like. It might not look like what you imagine, which would be a very natural, large natural area, <laughs> which a lot of wildlife corridors around the country um, are in areas that are uh, have a lot of preserved habitat. But in our case, like in the top one, you know, there's agricultural fields here. This is um, very close to the I-5 freeway. There's development here, and this is the corridor. Uh, there's, it's because it's six miles long, there's lots of different uh, parts of the corridor, and they look a little bit different in different areas. This is one of the tunnels. Um, it's an example of actually a well-designed tunnel where the animals can see the other ends of the tunnel so they're not as afraid to go through that area and then this is really one of the bright spots of our corridor right now which is um, in the central reach on five point land and to the right of this uh, 
there's going to be housing development, but this is a portion that um, Five Point, the developer, has been able to engineer landscape, and it's uh, really one of the success stories of our of our corridor. And um, let me go ahead and yeah. have John come up thanks. and talk thanks, more. Um, so thanks, everybody. Wanted to just spend a few minutes and share some information about the camera study that we performed on the Irvine Laguna Wildland Corridor. Uh, and just a little background first. So we uh, installed our first camera trap uh, in May of 2017, and we were able to collect data on all of our cameras through November of 2018. Uh, the, the entire project was conducted by a small group of volunteers. There were seven of us. So me, I'm a hiker, so I like to be out in the brush and the dirt and the mud being hands-on with the cameras. That's what I enjoy. A lot of the other team members didn't really care for that aspect of it, so they audited the images coming off the SD card, did the documentation. So really, all in all, everybody that was part of the project had a role that they really enjoyed doing, and it made for a, a wonderful team experience uh, going through the project. How we determined the locations for the cameras uh, is we spent many hours walking the walking the wildlife corridor, we'd look for things like pinch points. And a pinch point would typically be a, a culvert or an underpass. And that would be a location where an animal would have to, that's approaching, would have to make a directional decision. Are they going to continue going through? Are they going to turn around and go back the other way? So <coughs> we would look for those areas and make sure that we landed cameras there to observe the wildlife activity going on uh, around those pinch points. The other, uh, when there wasn't a culvert or an underpass, we'd uh, look for we look for traces of animal activity. So we'd look for scat, we'd look for tracks, we'd look for animal trails and things like that. And we'd make sure that we put cameras there to ensure that we're capturing wildlife activity. One of the things that we did that was uh, maybe a little unique to this type of project is, is kind of midway through the project, we brought in a professional tracker. And the first thing that we asked him to do is, is take a look at our existing camera locations and see if we needed to make any adjustments. Do we need to alter location, alter the orientation? Uh, that to ensure that we had uh, optimal ability to capture those wildlife images uh, that was, were occurring in the area. And then they, the uh, other thing that we asked him to do was see if we missed anything. Were there any areas of the wildlife corridor that we needed to install cameras that we didn't? And in fact, he did find a couple of locations for us. Uh, I think I have a picture of a bobcat and subsequent slide here. And that's a result of his effort. So he had found the location that we weren't monitoring. We got uh, a great capture of a bobcat uh, utilizing the corridor. Uh, the cameras that we used were Cuddyback E2 model cameras. And these are, these are good little cameras, uh, reasonably good performance. They're economical. And economical was important because, again, this corridor is running through an urban area, and we we're concerned about loss and vandalism. So we didn't want to break the bank on you know, $700 Reconyx cameras. So we chose these e Cuddyback E2s. And in fact, they did perform pretty well for us. We were very, very pleased with the results. And, uh, and so we were happy that we made that choice. That was a good decision. We set the cameras to operate 24 by 7, so they were, they were capturing uh, images uh, all hours of the day and night. We did actually, uh, ultimately in the project, set some of the cameras to hybrid mode. So what hybrid mode is, is it captures a still upon a motion detection, and then you can configure it to capture a 15 or 20 second video beyond that, that motion trigger. And where that's important is, usually when you see images from a camera trap, you don't know what the animal did after that still. So did the animal keep going? Did the animal make a decision to turn around? And we thought that that would be helpful for our analysis and understanding the animal behavior uh, that was occurring around our camera traps. The uh, types of field work that we did for the project is typical of this type of, uh, you know, t this type of work. So every month we would go out and service the cameras. When we were there, we would uh, swap the SD cards, we check and replace batteries if needed, we clean the uh, IR sensor, we clean the IR eliminator, uh, and uh, then we also uh, uh, confirm the camera settings and things like that. So occasionally these cameras would drop date and time, so we wanted to make sure that we had accurate timestamps on all of the images. So we would go through our checklist. We had a pretty precise checklist that anybody could follow uh, to ensure that the cameras were functioning properly. Uh, 
And then another thing that we ended up doing over time that we learned our lesson is we carry our clippers with us because there's nothing worse than getting an SD card image with 5,000 images of a plant blowing in front of it, trying to find those precious little, little uh, uh, images of wildlife that we're trying to track for our project. Uh, so when we're all done with all the data collection, we probably had you know, 9,000 plus images. Uh, we actually uh, worked with Kevin Clark and his team at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And what we asked him to do was take our images, analyze the data, and prepare a report of the findings. Um, so he did that for us, and I think Gabby's gonna share with you a link. Uh, we don't have time today to go, to go into all the detail about what we found over the course of the study, but if you're interested, I will give you a link where you can download that entire report and, uh, and, and go through it if you'd like to. So over the course of the project, we had several challenges. We encountered several challenges, and I'll talk about a couple of them here. One area that, that uh, is particularly challenging, even to this day, is an area around the I-5-405 interchange. Everybody in this room has driven over that many, many, many times, and you probably didn't realize that this was there. But under all 16 lanes of the freeway there, there is a massive tunnel that's intended to be part of the wildlife corridor. This tunnel is 25 foot wide, 15 foot tall, 1,100 foot long, and pitch black dark inside, intended to be used as part of the wildlife corridor. During rainy seasons, like we've had here now, the volume of water going through that tunnel is extraordinary. We have, uh, even back in the time, back when we did the study, not as wet as this season was, we had occasions, our cameras are sitting on stakes three foot tall. We've had cameras completely submerged. So the volume of water is, is incredible through here. So there's, there's no way in the world an animal can navigate its way through here, through this tunnel, when we're having rainy seasons like this. The other challenge is when it's dry, there's a continual human presence 24 seven, all hours of the day and night, there's noise, there's lights, there's music, there's paint fumes, all kinds of stuff going on over here all the time. So again, an animal would approach the see all this commotion going on and no way in the world it's gonna choose to proceed. We um, also encountered captures on our cameras of potentially dangerous and disturbing things going on in this area to the point where we chose as a team not to send a single person to service these cameras here. So we made a decision it's going to only be two or three of us that are going to go out there. We're going to try to strategically find the right time of the day that we can go out when it's less likely to encounter people. And that was the way we, we kind of proceeded. Um, for vandalism, this was the only area where we had camera vandalism over the course of the entire project. And uh, we, we assumed that the you know, taggers probably thought they were putting the cameras out there to capture their behavior, but really we were just you know, trying, to, trying to monitor wildlife activity there. So that was a, that was a problem. Um, to the point that we had cameras in this location for over a year, and in that entire year, all those images captured, we never had even a single instance of an animal that made it all the way through the tunnel, not even a single instance. We had many, many captures of an animal approaching the tunnel, <coughs> turning around and going back the other way. We had several instances where 50, 75 feet into the tunnel we'd see scat, so we assumed it's a small mammal going in there trying to forage for food scraps left by the taggers, but never did we have even a single animal that made it through this tunnel that's intended to be part of the wildlife corridor. So that is, that is an issue that we have to address. An another challenge that we encountered was kind of this lower picture here, and this is Irvine Center Boulevard. Uh, when we installed our cameras here, this whole area was lush with green, tall, beautiful vegetation, provided plenty of cover, provided plenty of food source for animals. It was wonderful. That's what it looks like today. So we had no idea of that, and, and I kind of get it because a lot of the wildlife corridor is part of uh, Serrano Creek and San Diego Creek, and it needs to convey water, but we had no idea that at some random point in time, they kind of go in there with heavy equipment and scrape the, the landscape bare. So we, we think about you know animals that are that are trying to migrate their way through the wildlife corridor, and they have these you know, this beautiful habitat that they can use, and then all of a sudden, at some point in time, it's going to get scraped bare. How does that how does that impact wildlife use of the of the corridor? So we have to we have to try to understand and plan for that. Uh -huh. Because once it becomes an established wetland, everything changes. 
Oh, oh that's, that's right. That's fascinating. Yeah. One of the reasons why they clear out all the channel lights is that it's a defect of several channels, and all of a sudden all the rules change, and you can hardly see how the cat is, you know, like a new law has come into play. Uh, like, at least that's how I understood it when I was writing all those documents. It was that way. Yeah, why? My whole experience with this area was it was all green, 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 and all of a sudden I went over there one day and you're like, what is going on? <laughs> and you kind of made us think of, think a little bit more about how we, and you know, they could they could kind of still do what they need to, but still don't pile debris on the side, you know. They could probably still leave a nice usable path for wildlife to make it through rather than mm -hmm. to disturb it to this extent. Yeah, I feel like I've seen it where they've, where they've cleared the channel only on one half. On one half, exactly. And then the next the other half, yeah, that yeah. seems to work out really better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So th this is kind of a busy slide. This wasn't uh, our work effort. Um, there was a collar study, bobcat collar, bobcat and collar, bobcat collar study done back in 2008. And it kind of shows that, uh, that again, this issue of the I-5405 interchange. So we have a lot of bobcat moving through the coastal wilderness up to this area, but in no cases did we ever get a crossing. So even back in 2008, uh, it was still an issue where uh, bobcat were not able to make it across that, that significant exchange. So it's, it really is leading to a biologically isolated island, if you will, for the, the coastal wilderness over here. And that's what we're trying to address with the wildlife corridor. Another aspect of their study were mortality events for bobcat and coyote. So it, it's, it, it makes it even more important that we have a safe passage for wildlife through this area since it's through a you know, primarily urban area so that wildlife aren't motivated to roam out onto our urban roadways and become victims of vehicle strike, which is what this is showing here. So the, the goals of, the, we had several goals for the, for the project, for the camera study project. One was, to, you know, were there any animals that were making their way through that Serrano Creek culvert, that big scary tunnel uh, that I showed in the picture? Did we have any animals that made it through there? Uh, we also wanted to try and understand um, how wildlife, are there any barriers to wildlife movement through the traditional remnant corridor, which is through the Spectrum 5 industrial complex. So everything south of the five is kind of part of the remnant corridor and it weaves and winds its way through. And are there any barriers that we need to address that prevent wildlife from effortlessly making their way through there? We wanted to take a look at that. Uh, since a lot of the uh, corridor on the south coastal side of the five uh, is a convergence of three, three creeks, San Diego, Serrano, and, and Bee Creek, uh, it was traditionally rich in wildlife down there. We wanted to try and quantify how much wildlife is still there, trying to utilize the corridor what types of wildlife. So that was another goal of the study to try to understand that. And then uh, since the areas uh, become so urbanized, uh, built up, we've got residential, we've got parks, we've got industrial, we've got every, everything down there. What's the impact of humans and pets and their encroachment into these areas that were traditionally free for wildlife to roam? So th these are our camera placements. These are our camera groupings. And at the very top, those cameras were there to monitor wildlife that are coming down from Cleveland National Forest through the Santa Ana Mountain foothills and entering into our wildlife corridor. At the very bottom, that's that remnant corridor that runs its way through Spectrum 5 Industrial that I mentioned we wanted to try and understand and quantify how wildlife was moving through that area. What we weren't able to monitor is that two and a half mile reach between these camera groupings. The reason we couldn't do that is the developer Five Point is building a, and they have an incredible project going on. They are building a wildlife corridor from the ground up through an entirely urban area. Uh, we don't know that that's ever been done before. and We don't think it's actually even being done now. So when that's completed, we're gonna really have something special down here. And it's, it's, it's an amazing, work effort that they're doing right now, working on this corridor, that two and a half mile reach of the corridor. Um, we obviously, there's so much construction going on, has been, continues to this day. Uh, we couldn't get in there with cameras and do any monitoring, but we're, we're eager to try to understand uh, how wildlife is utilizing that area. And we hope to be able to do that at some point. 
So th this is just a, a quick slide to, um, to emphasize once again the, the number of days that we had cameras deployed collecting data out in the field. So we had a lot of our cameras that were collecting data for well over a year. And I had mentioned Kevin Clark and his team that put together the report for us. Uh, he's done, he and his team have done many studies like this and he said usually he gets three months, a few months of data, he has to put the, together the report, just not a, a, a good volume of data. What we were able to do by having cameras out in the field for so long is understand any seasonality impacts on wildlife utilizing the corridor, dry season, wet season, migration patterns and things like that. So we were thankful to be able to have cameras deployed for so long collecting data. And uh, again, Kevin Clark and his team were, were uh, pretty excited about having that volume of data to do the analysis on our report. Uh, what would a camera study presentation be without pictures of wildlife? So there are some. Coyotes, lots of coyotes, lots and lots of coyotes. This is a happy coyote. He has a meal in his mouth and not so good for the meal, but he's a, he's a happy coyote right now. <coughs> And I had mentioned that bobcat uh, picture, so here's a bobcat on the prowl. Uh, looks like he's about, uh, about to go after something. And again, this was uh, thanks to our, our tracker that we, we brought on for a short period of time to help us find a new location that we weren't monitoring, and uh, we got a nice bobcat picture out of it. Um, raccoon, we have some raccoon. There's one on the dry, one on the wet. We saw a lot of this case where they're kind of running in parallel together. That's kind of a unique sort of a thing that we see with, with uh, raccoon a lot um, and, and another coyote. Uh, we had many, many, I, I, we have so many phenomenal pictures from the, from the camel study. I wish I could spend an hour just going through pictures, but, but we don't have time for that, unfortunately. But uh, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a few up on our site. That we, Debbie and I were just kind of talking about mm -hmm. it. And that might be fun to have up on our wildlifecorridor.org site mm -hmm. for people to see some of the, the images from our camera traps. Here's another one. Here's a California ground squirrel, squirrel and a greater roadrunner making prints uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, in the corridor here. We saw a lot of instances of this actually, you know, different species kind of coexisting in the same space and you'd think that they're kind of, kind of separated from each other and everything like that. We have a lot of instances where they kind of shared a little space together for a short period of time. And some mustard. Yeah. And, mustard. <laughs> and black mustard. <laughs> Can't get away from black mustard. It's going to be everywhere. <laughs> so, so what were the findings? Um, you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that the most prevalent species observed over the course of the project were coyote. Coyote are everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And uh, what you may be surprised to see, um, and we were certainly surprised and dismayed, is the second most prevalent species observed in the wildlife corridor were humans which is a huge, huge problem. That is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, all of the other species observations were significantly less than coyotes and humans. And just a, a little clarification for this slide. So that is a 965 coyotes that we saw over the course of the project. These are, these are observation days. We had, to, we had to figure out how to approach this. So, so in other words, if we had, on a particular day, we had an image of a coyote, and we saw 15 more coyote that, on that same day, that counts as one. Because we had no way of going in with you know, the team that we had and uniquely identify every single trait on each animal to be able to kind of quantify individually. There's just no way to do that. So we, we used this methodology for our study, and I, I think it's valid for, for our work effort here, but uh, uh, that I just wanted to clarify kind of what that slide means. And here's a here's a, a slide kind of stating the obvious. Um, so on the x-axis down there on the bottom, those are our camera groupings, not individual cameras, camera groupings. On the y-axis, percent observations. So what that's saying, borne out by the data, is that on camera groupings, where we had a significant human observation, we had minimal animal observations. Conversely, when we had very very few human observations, we had lots and lots of animal observations. So again, we need to figure out a way to address human encroachment into what will be the wildlife corridor. I'm sorry, is there an assumption based on the last slide that some of the smaller animals may have been missed? Like did may have been, trigger the cameras? Like may have been missed. We're certainly, and even birds, even birds were part. Right, so so we, we know 
for a fact that we're going to meet, miss some of the. The cameras are pretty good at detecting anything down to, um, you know, certainly cottontail, certainly down to squirrel. So we're pretty good with our orientation on capturing those. Obviously, if I have a you know camera trap right here, it's easy for it to go around on the other side. So we, we had to make. We kind of put our placements so that we could ha have the best opportunity to capture all of the wildlife going by, but we know that we are going to miss miss some things. So is there some way they extrapolate if we're seeing this much of something? In the we can assume yeah. that that there's that that's correct. That's correct. And when there was that slide, I'm sure that was all mammals. That's all mammals. Mammal. We um, have. Did you? Drill it down we did, we did, and I, and I don't have those slides here, but it is in the in the report. I encourage mm -hmm. you to download it. So we had it by raccoons, we had it by yeah. different mammals. So I would imagine that coyotes may be getting used to humans, <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, a little, a little bit. I, you know, so so again, this is monitoring right in the corridor itself. So we know that we see uh, coyotes in neighborhoods and everything yeah. like that, and they're you know they're foraging around. So I think maybe those are getting a little used to humans, maybe a little too used to humans, but, you know, coyotes in the, and rat mammal, animals inside of the corridor, I think maybe still are a little bit more skittish. You know, bobcats are, are traditionally stealthy. I mean, we were actually really surprised to, to get bobcat because uh, coyotes will just roam right up and down a path, right up and down a trail, and bobcat might be a little bit more stealthy out in the brush and everything like that. Yeah, there's a lot more informa detailed information in the study um, yeah. document. What kind of humans were they? So, <laughs> so we had uh, everything from, so some of the humans were um, uh, probably OC flood people working in, you know, clearing out brush. Uh, bikers, people walking around roaming, uh, mm -hmm. unhoused. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of the entrance to the wildlife corridor here. And that's one I, I still remember to this day. We kind of showed up to do some work on, on our cameras to service our cameras. And uh, a gentleman, a house gentleman, had set up a camp probably 40 feet square. He had his sleeping stuff, his cooking stuff, and he was just plopped right down in the middle of the, of the, uh, the corridor. Um, and, and what we do in those cases, and even in the case of some of the things that I showed you over there at that, that big tunnel where we had issues, is um, you know, we will notify local police if there are issues that need to be addressed and uh, they will come out and take care of any needs, but that's a case, and that's for, yeah, for his safety even, being out there in the middle of nowhere. It's, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, so lots of different types of people. Hikers, walker, unhoused, mm -hmm. everything. Uh -huh. uh, how does this area uh, designate? Is it a wildlife area or is it a park area? Or of course it's a wildlife area. So is it protected from people to enter into it or the signs? I'm just curious as to Supposedly, <laughs> supposedly, yeah. <laughs> it's not fenced off. It's not fenced off, and that's one of the things, one of the things actually I'm going to talk about, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so as, as part of uh, Kevin Clark's work, uh, the report that he put together for us, we asked him to come up with some recommendations. What can we do to help encourage wildlife mobility through the area, connectivity? What can we do to make, make it a better path for wildlife to use? So one of the things, um, there's a lot of riprap. So again, since much of the, especially in the remnant side of the corridor is creek, there's a lot of riprap and that's there to manage water flow and everything that riprap does that you can imagine. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that needs to be addressed because animals don't like to walk on big bouldery rocks and things like that. So we have to look at that. And fencing. So we know that fencing would help contain wildlife within the wildlife corridor, also would help keep people out, well, keep everybody out, but it'll keep, it'll discourage people from going into the corridor. Uh, so fencing is very important. Uh, there's, there, there are areas of the corridor that fence, are not conducive to fencing. So what do we do to kind of try to keep people out of the corridor? Maybe you plant thorny brush, you know, plant, plant some choya, plant some prickly pear, things like that that'll kind of keep people from wanting to wander down in there. So that's, that's important as well. And, and then that big tunnel, it's, it, it, that needs a study on its own. If that is going to be part of the wildlife corridor, function as part of the wildlife corridor, a big study needs to take place to see if that's workable. Might not be. Maybe, might not be. Do animals ever go over rather than under? I love that idea. 
<laughs> Love that idea. Plus the culture. Yeah. <laughs> four or five. Yeah. Under. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you can't go under, you've got to go over. But I love that idea. <laughs> so, so visually, kind of that, that chart that uh, that I just showed you on Kevin's recommendations on what we might do. So, this is Lake Forest Boulevard. This is actually the entrance to the Wildlife Corridor. So, we talked about the riprap there. So, something needs to be done to make that more usable for wildlife. Um, when I mentioned the the gentleman that was unhoused that had kind of set up his camp, he was like right there, right in the middle of it, right there for quite some time. Um, but again, wildlife animals are going to approach that and see that going on. They're going to go back the other way. So we need, we need to figure out a way to fix this area. Fencing would be extremely important. Um, and we even uh, were looking at potentially a study to do some of these test remediations around a specific area just to understand the impact that it would have by doing some of the things that are suggested. So we need to address the riprap. Uh, the, we had a camera trap on the other side of this overpass, and that was one of our most successful ca camera traps we had. You know, the volume of, of wildlife that we saw going through there, the diversity of wildlife, many, many different species. Those little raccoon, that was kind of right under here that I showed you in one of the pictures. So we know that and to the right of this slide is, is the coastal wilderness. So Laguna Coast Wilderness, um, Barber's Lake, Irvine Open Space that's between Barber's Lake and Lake Forest. That's that whole area to the right of this slide. So we know that wildlife are trying to make it through. They're trying to come out of the coastal wilderness and make it through the wildlife corridor. We just need to find a way to make it easier for them to do so. Is there an alternative like Oso Creek? Uh, don't know. So it has to connect. So everything, I, I wish I could actually put up like a map. You can, act, looking at like Google Satellite, you can almost follow the corridor all the way down through Serrano and San Diego Creek all the way down. Uh, don't know if there'd be connectivity from Oso all the way over. So there would have to be connectivity, uh, fluid connectivity from the area at Irvine Boulevard, Magazine Road, Bake Parkway, Alton up there, all the way down through Lake Forest and Bake, which is kind of where this is. And the creek does follow. The creek does follow except for that crazy break where the freeway is, the 5, 5405. Uh, then that, that, that tunnel, uh, what do you do for this tunnel? Um, needs to be illuminated more. Uh, you know, this shot, that's actually our tractor guy. Um, this, this shot right here uh, shows that there's light in there, but there is, there's not enough light inside of this tunnel at all. And then again, we, we talked about the water, the volume of water that occurs uh, when we have wet seasons. It looks like we do in California now, which is wonderful. Um, so, you know, some of the things that were talked about are critter shelves. So you, you give the animal a safe path above the water to get through, rodent tubes, things like that. Don't know if that's going to work for this tunnel. Might, might not, but those are some of the things that are being explored to, to make that a, a workable solution. Love this picture. So we talked about fencing. This is actually a picture of the Five Point Wildlife Corridor that I talked about. This is a phenomenal project that they're doing. You can see here we've got some native plant, we've got some choya, we've got some cilia, we've got, we've got lots of native plant growing and they're, they're loving. This picture is probably, uh, I think I took this maybe about a month ago. So it's, this is a recent view of what the five point two and a half mile reach of the wildlife corridor looks like today. The fencing that they're putting in, it's a, it's a special fencing that they designed that uh, is, you know, obviously it's gonna keep wildlife in but it's also kind of, kind of built to try to keep humans out. And again, this, this area is gonna be exclusive for wildlife use. No hiking trails, no biking trails, no humans, only for wildlife. Well, how is the developer doing this? Did they get permission to build in yes. exchange for Yes, that? they did. Okay, so it's not as uh, So uh, actually to answer your question, I don't know <laughs> if there was any mitigation credits or anything associated with it. This is, this is yeah, this was a passion of one of the founders, he's, he's very, very into wildlife and open space, and, and uh, uh, but of course he's a developer too. So this whole area, and Gabby showed you kind of a picture, an, an aerial view. That picture was older, uh, but you can kind of see even, even today. Her picture showed just open space. You can all actually see housing going in. Mm -hmm. 
So again, this, this corridor is, is completely unique. It's running through a completely urban area. But it's an incre incredible work effort that they're putting on right now. And this is a view looking south, so you can see kind of the coastal wilderness out there. View looking north, uh, looking Santa Ana Mountains there. A couple of, we talked about hiking there, love uh, Santiago Peak and Majesca Peak. Can't wait to get back up there before it gets too hot. Um, but uh, this this corridor is is unbelievable. This usually you think about a wildlife corridor as maybe a repurposed stream bed and things like that. But this this is vast. I mean, this is a quarter mile across in some areas, exclusively for wildlife use. So it's it's really really a fantastic project, and we're we're so excited about it, and can't wait for them to finish. Don't know when they'll finish. That's usually the next question is when are they going to be done with it? But they've made uh, tremendous progress, and uh, you know I, I would guess it's single-digit, low single-digit years before it's completed, at least the reach that they're working on. So we're really, really excited about that. Are they making an effort to educate the surrounding neighborhoods that this is what it is and why it's there and why you shouldn't climb the fence? Yeah, I'll, I'll for, for sure that's going to be part of it. A lot of the, the, the homes that I showed there, these, these aren't occupied yet, so these are just still under construction, but I'm sure they're going to do that. There's even been some talk about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, putting some monuments and things like that around so people understand what they're seeing because that's I mean if you live in this neighborhood that's kind of cool to know that you have a purpose-built wildlife corridor going all the way through. Oh, we'll just put a hiking trail in there and put, keep the people away from the wildlife. Yeah they aren't going to let no hiking in there. They aren't going to let it for sure. They're, they'll, they'll, they'll probably have trails they'll probably have trails on the outside so they'll have things for people to do that can walk around or walk up and down the, the perimeter but they won't allow it. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very yeah. unusual, Usually, but it's fully human, so to do that, it's just a really great it's, thing. It's, it's quite a, yeah, because like you said, usually it's kind of a multi-use kind of an environment when you set aside open it, space. Right? Yeah. Human to human, but that does get the point. Yeah. 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 Is that an irrigation mm -hmm. uh, toolkit? Which? Yes, right? yes. Yeah, they're currently watering it. So they, they put in irrigation, and again, this, this, uh -huh. this reach is two and a half miles long, in a lot of cases a quarter mile across. And they are actually irrigating for right now, uh, probably not right now because we had so much rain, but the intent when they started the development of this is that they would irrigate it and, and make sure that all the native plants and everything like that could grow in. And that's another, we talked about invasive plants. So right now they are hand pulling this area. Yeah, so, no mustard. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, that's something that they have to address. And I, I know that uh, the person that I work with over at Five Point had, had a little area and he was doing some tests on what he could use any kind of an herbicide that he might be able to use in some instances when it's when it's you know, over with it wouldn't hurt the animals wouldn't hurt the native plants and things like that so a lot of tests are going to be uh, are, are going to be done to try to determine that. Are other roadway undercrossings involved like river boats or city streets? Yeah so this this it crosses uh, I don't have don't have a map that I could show but yeah, so like um, Alton uh, there's a cross there's several Alton and Barranca. Well, Alton yeah. and Barranca, mm -hmm. and then there's the other one. I can't think of the name of the roadway up there. Uh, Irvine Boulevard? No, it will be yeah, Irvine Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So so the wildlife corridor comes in. So <coughs> visually, if you know the area, the, uh, the entrance, if you will, top north entrance to the wildlife corridor is at Irvine Boulevard and Magazine Road. That's an underpass. That, uh, I can't really see it. It was right. Kind of way out there. That's Irvine mm -hmm. Boulevard way out there. There are several underpasses, and and actually that picture that Gabby showed a while back. Just go back. Yeah, let me just go back to it real quick. Let me show you. So they all along the route where there are underpasses, they created these special tunnels. Uh, this was their own design. So they're you know, soft bottom for animals to move through. They ensure that you could, the animal could see to the other end because animals don't want to go into a dark space where they can't see out the other side. So they wanted to ensure that there was light through. Uh, you know, round corners versus sharp corners for visibility. So a lot of effort on uh, the probably one, two, three, four uh, undercrossings, overcrossings along the corridor were, uh, were done to accommodate, to accommodate wildlife specifically. When you said overcrossings, are there overcrossings for uh, 
Is it I'm sorry, over, yeah, yeah, it's so, so um, tunnels, roadway on top. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. cars. Yeah. yeah, that's what it looked like. Actually, that's Gabby's picture that she showed you. Uh, so a lot of this is now turned in, in developing as residential. And that's what it started. So you can see all the grading, and even they, they even went to the effort of ensuring that you know it wasn't just like a flat. Pit. Since they're building this from the ground up, they could do anything they, they want. But they made sure that there were undulations in the in the terrain and twists and turns, so it wouldn't just be this flat, long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just really re remarkable. Yeah, and this used to be like an air force base, right? Yeah, the military base. So they really started from complete scratch. Today. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all I had. Okay, so my turn again. Your turn. Sorry, your sorry. turn. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, thank you, John. Uh, let's take questions too. Thank you. So, just conclusions, kind of big picture from the camera study is um, like two or three main takeaways. We know that no large mammals are getting under that freeway crossing. Um, the we call it the big scary tunnel, but for you know all the reasons we talked about, design issues, human water. presence, mm -hmm. water, you know, standing water, all of those things, is um, what our uh, science advisors are telling us. Um, human intrusions are a problem. That's something we need to to figure out. Um, you know, we have been developing partnerships with the um, city of Irvine. We've had a partnership for a long time, um, ongoing conversations about how we can deal with this issue in particular. Uh, and, you know, this is really something that's urgent because like I talked about before with the needs of our animals, um, really showing some signs of genetic inbreeding. And um, we just know that when you isolate a whole ecosystem, from the other areas around it, it can it eventually will um, really have some serious ecological issues. So uh, these animals, and even the plants, you know, we don't talk that much about the plants um, with wildlife corridors, but the plants also depend on the animals to move around the landscape. So it's really uh, urgent that we continue to make sure this corridor is working correctly. So our call to action as an organization is, you know, improving the corridor function so all of our stakeholders involved in the project um, uh, have a, a role to play in that. We want to facilitate natural animal movement and we want to ensure the ecosystem integrity of the 22,000 acres of um, the coastal side especially. Um, And I uh, just want to acknowledge you know, all the people that made this camera study possible. It really was a huge effort. We had volunteers, we had uh, the Natural History Museum helping us with the analysis and report. And of course, um, you know, several people at Laguna Greenbelt, the board and our working group that we put together for this and other projects. Uh, you're welcome to go to wildlifecorridor.org. It's easy to remember, and <laughs> we have lots of things to look at there, but uh, one tab is the camera study, and you can actually download the whole report, and there's lots of graphs and all of that if you're into the da data aspect of it. Um, feel free to call us, email us. We do have social media as well, Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok now and Twitter, and we're at Laguna Greenbelt is our handle. And uh, I'll come back to this, but one little fun thing we wanted to show um, is one of the videos that we got. Sometimes you get a treat. Sometimes you get a fun treat. So this is a video of a, a family of coyotes in front of one of our cameras. No sound, sorry, but it's like a mom with two, two babies. <laughs> it's just so sweet. Yeah, it kind of just brings home like these are our neighbors too. You know, we talk about our neighbors being people, but these are our wild neighbors, so we try to do right by them too. <laughs> do we have any questions or thoughts on this? Um, anything else comes to mind? Yes. Uh, what, uh, I just got an agency, but 
who, who is it that actually owns or oversees or manages this corridor of the land? Is it multiple cities or is it Orange County itself? Like who is the organization yeah. that, that ultimately has control over what happens here? So uh, there are, the corridor is chopped up into kind of different pieces. The landowners, um, Five Point and the Irvine Company are the two main landowners. And so they are responsible for portions of it and then there's um, the county of Orange has jurisdiction over some areas um, and the city of, city of Irvine would be the other kind of government uh, player there. So the city of Irvine worked with Five Point and like uh, Laguna Greenbelt and Laguna Greenbelt's partners, uh, nonprofit partners back in 2010 to 2013, and in 2013, they actually established a zoning for the area um, that John was talking about at the five point section. So that was like probably the most, how would I say, uh, like the most obvious kind of documentation of this wildlife corridor that has zoning. It, it was funded, you know, with a partnership with Five Point, so they like actually funded all of that work as well. And establishing that part of the corridor. Um, but that was, you know, just like a, it goes to show like the partnerships that can happen, the private-public partnerships and collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a 10th year anniversary this year of that plan being adopted in the city of Irvine. And uh, that would be great if we could yeah. do more of that. But, but the corridor <laughs> has been a passion for um, a couple of names that you might or might not know, um, Dr. Elizabeth Brown and Mary Fagris. Uh, this has been a passion of theirs for, for 20 years. I've, I've been part of the project for maybe six or seven now, but this has been something. So, you know, kind of seeing a lot of things come to fruition, especially that's, that reach of the, that Five Point is doing, is, is, it's rewarding. It's really rewarding to see it kind of come together. But for, to think about somebody that kind of wakes up every day for 20 years thinking about how we can make an easier path for wildlife to make it from Cleveland National Forest into Laguna Coast Wilderness and back, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's pretty special. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. So is there room to put an overbridge? Uh, yeah, so the, the, ch the challenges are you know, 16 lanes of freeway down there. Um, you know, I, I, I smiled when, when we were kind of talking about it because the, I, I personally don't know if the tunnel is going to be usable or I don't know if you can make that work. And I'm, sh I'm sure smart know engineers can figure out a way to do anything but it's that's if you think about that interchange how many flyovers there are I mean that would have to be a pretty Flying tall on yeah, cars. yeah but um, there are uh, creek extensions on either side of the freeway slightly south of where that tunnel is that might make a, an easier way for uh, a bridge to go over but it's and I think you mentioned that I think you're kind of joking about it, but you're right, I mean, it would be phenomenally expensive. Well, the 405 up in yeah. Hollywood, yeah. the KC way. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Who paid for that? Uh, I don't know if that was... Uh, Are you talking about Liberty Canyon? Liberty Canyon Bridge. Uh, oh, it's uh, yeah, it's over the 101. They just broke ground on that recently. So. Oh, yeah, in LA, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. That was like, we'd love to have that, right? Oh, we would. <laughs> we would. We'd love to have yeah. that, yeah. The funding from that was kind of a collaboration. So the state of California put in many millions <laughs> and there was a lot of private funding as well. And the last bit came from Wallace Annenberg. And um, it's so funny because I just adopted two kittens from Wallace Annenberg's like pet space. <laughs> so she must be an animal uh, advocate because then she also donated to that project as well. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much.